Welcome to In Conversation. I'm your host, Steve Iverson. Uh, I was recently listening to um, an NPR piece on the radio, and uh, I heard a woman speaking about uh, having used cannabis to deal with uh, side effects of um, cancer treatment. Uh, at first I thought, well, <clears throat> she's a very articulate, thoughtful woman. And then I said, um, I think I know that woman. And it turned out to be um, Kate Murphy, um, who is with us here today to talk about um, her experience uh, using cannabis with assistance from a specialist physician to help with the side effects of cancer treatment. Um, we also have jo Dr. Jordan Tischler, uh, who provided that assistance to her. Uh, and I'd like to welcome you both and thank you for coming in. Thank you. Thank you. You bet. Um, so Kate, um, I remember you saying that day that um, the thing that you sought help for at that time, mostly, I think, was um, not being able to eat enough, losing some weight, uh, not being interested in food, and so on. Uh, is that correct? Yes, I felt very nauseous from the treatments. Nauseous, okay. from the chemotherapy. From the chemotherapy, yeah. and then that just and made it harder for me to eat. I lost weight, yeah. I didn't have strength, yeah. and then I just felt like I needed to find some sort of solution. So, um, where did you first hear that uh, cannabis might be something that could help with this and something you should look into? So uh, the first day that I had chemotherapy, I remember speaking to someone, um, a patient in the ward with me, and he came up to me and he said, oh my, you look way too happy. It was my first day of chemotherapy. Okay. Um, to, to be having chemotherapy and to be here. And he said the only way, and he looked kind of sad, mm. he said the only way that I was able to survive this was by getting medical marijuana. So just remember that. Mm. And I remember thinking, what is he talking about? Because of course I felt great at the time. Mm -hmm. And I kind of must have filed that away. Mm. So, you know, time goes by, months pass, um, and I'm actually not feeling well, losing weight, um, feeling nauseous all the time and kind of looking for solutions and in conjunction with that was doing a little bit of research on kind of what kind of treatment I should have. I had some options with the doctors in terms of surgery, et cetera, and I was talking to friends about that. So a friend of a friend actually was a physician, which she didn't mention until the end of the conversation, and she asked how I was feeling after we had kind of wrapped up our conversation, and then she started talking about her research and to THC, and she was like well into her 70s. I remember I had a stigma with medical marijuana that I had had. I, that wasn't something that I would plan on doing anyways. And I remember she talked to me about it and she said, if you think about it and you look in the future, I'm telling you there are going to be healing opportunities here and it should really be embraced and you should really think about it. So mm -hmm. those two things kind of triggered me um, to initially look into it. I see. And how did you find Dr. Tischler, who specializes in this treatment? So at the time, this is 2016, mm. I remember researching quickly online and finding like maybe one or two doctors out there um, with different names, uh, catchy names, you know, that I thought, oh, what is this all about? Um, it didn't you mean seem the, they had catchy names or the practice had the pra a catchy the, name? The practices okay. did. Inhale, like what, what? Yeah. you right. know? Right. Um, and there was another one, I don't remember the name of it anyways. Mm. And I remember thinking, how do you distinguish? Because to me, this is kind of a, a big deal and yeah. I needed some advice. Yeah. Um, so I asked a friend <laughs> and a, who was a doctor, mm -hmm. and he actually said, okay, ask our other friend who's not a doctor. Mm -hmm. He said, I think she has more of a handle kind of on this, and she oh. had some friends. So I went to her, and um, I also tried to ask my oncologists, and they didn't, had no, no, no advice either way. How's mm -hmm. that? And no opinions mm -hmm. either way. But then I you know, called his office and um, had an introductory interview or mm -hmm. whatever conversation we spoke sure. about the benefits of it. So you're... Your treaters are all helpful, skillful, talented people, but when it comes to this particular topic, they say, we, we can't really do anything. Um, yes. And you end case. up uh, seeking out Dr. Tischler. And um, was, is there an, I imagine there's an initial meeting where you discuss what's going on, what might be helpful, and so on. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, uh, do you, does your practice uh, specialize in many different uses of cannabis, or is it mostly focused on alleviating symptoms of chemotherapy? Well, uh, there are a number of uh, sort of indications uh, that we treat, and um, uh, but I have to say that, that of late, uh, certainly the um, population who have cancer take a, a large percentage of the folks that we see, um, in large measure because 
well, they're really sick. And mm. one of the things that I set out to do in my practice was really to focus on taking care of people who have real illness. Um, you know, there are, the state of things is that there are some doctors out there who will sort of give you a medical cannabis card, um, but that's sort of what they'll do, right? It's, they're not really in the, in the business of kind of treating and guiding and such like that. So they will do sort of the minimum state expectation, which is they will pronounce you a yes or a no for getting the card. Um, uh, my view has always been that that's just not practicing medicine and it's not sufficient care. So my view has always been that the card is sort of the tool, the end of the discussion, if you will, um, or maybe it's the middle of the discussion, but, um, but it isn't sort of the immediate goal. The immediate goal is to say, how can we use this stuff to help you? What is it that's going on with you? What medicines are taking? So anybody who comes to my practice, before we sit down together, um, the first thing is medical records. Let's see what's going on. What are your practitioners doing for and to you? What medicines are you on? What other medicines might you be on that aren't relevant to the issue that we're talking about, but are very relevant to your care in the broadest picture? And so we kind of go through that sort of thing. And if everything there looks appropriate, then we sort of have the first visit where we can sit down and talk about, you know, what is cannabis? Why does it work? What do we expect it can do for you in the positive? What are the side effects? What are the risks? All of those sorts of things, plus some of the really practical stuff, which is, so what's it gonna be like when you go to the dispensary? What kind of advice and or misadvice might you get? Um, what are sort of their motives and all of this sort of thing? What products do they have that I think are good for you? What products do they have that I think you should stay away from? Uh, I will say that, you know, um, in the process of my practicing this, uh, we've come up with a folder that every patient gets through the process and then we walk through it, but then they go home with it so that they can look at it again and not remember every, have to remember everything I said. And I keep refining that because patients come back and they say, well, I went to the dispensary and this happened, you know, or uh, I tried this kind of uh, preparation and, you know, this is what happened. So. You know, I th I'd like to think that my practice has refined even since I was taking care of Kate. Mm. Continuous uh, improvement. That's the idea. Yes. So you, um, you decide you'll give it a try, and then uh, you told me a story about going to the dispensary, and it was uh, a really um, unusual experience. You went in with your family, <laughs> and somebody said, get them out, they can't be in here. Oh, and I was going to be crazy about this. Um, you were on steroids, I was, you, yeah. in, before you take the medicine. So you're a little amped up, which I am anyway, so it just made it all the more better for me. Um, and I felt like, you know, this is, this is an experience I'm going to share with my family, you know, because most <laughs> of the experiences yeah. with being yeah. sick are, you know, you're lying horizontal, like, oh, I do not feel well, please go away. Um, so I was like, all right, mommy, we're going to do this, and we're going to go to dinner somewhere yummy, and, and we're just, you, mommy, and I tried to explain to them, you know, and I have three children, and the youngest at the time was, you know, seven. Yeah. And I said to my husband, he's like, whatever. I'm like, let's go. It's in Brookline. It's in a bank. It's a beautiful bank. Let's go together in there. So I get in there, and we park, and um, we meet, we get in the elevator, and we get up there, and there, there's a policeman like, what are you doing? Like, get, get out. Like, they were not interested in any conversation. Like, yeah, yeah. move on. Get out of here. No, no kids. You know, no children. What, what is wrong well, with actually, you? actually, no, nobody else, else other than the car oh. holder. Now, that actually has changed. Oh, okay. Has it? Okay. Yes. As of last November they have made it so an accompanying person can get a visitor pass. Good. But getting into these places is like Fort Knox. Yeah. You go through these things that they call man traps, which basically is a door that's locked yes. and you go through it and it locks behind really? you before the next door opens. Wow. You have to mm -hmm. sign in and wear a badge and you know, show your pass and, yep. you know, and show your I, license. I think it's often easier to walk into a gun store then I'll do all that. <laughs> That's it, a whole different. It, it was a little disarming. Yeah. yeah, it was because mm -hmm. then and then I'm in there by myself after that experience where they take my family and push them out. My husband's like, "Nice job, Kate." You know. Yeah. And so they they all leave and I get in line and it's it's a bank and they treat you like you're in a bank. Like all of the drugs are in a um, safe deposit box. Yeah. They pull them all out. They individualize. They hand you a menu and the menu was 
like just an out-of-body experience. It was like so many choices and, you know, what you're after. And Is it like being at a restaurant? You look at the menu choices? Like it was like 40 pages, you know what I mean? Wow. But it was just small print and it wasn't 40 pages, but it was big. And you're looking at it like, oh, man. And you're, you're already, if you're there and you're truly there, you're sick. You don't feel your best. You don't look your best. You're a little bit impaired because I'm sure you're on other drugs, yeah. you know, the, the steroids and stuff. So it just, I remember thinking, oh, you would be kidding me. It's a little overwhelming. And I, and I think I told you the part that was a little bit amusing is that I'm in line. I'm cycling through. And this guy turns around and he says, did you see that tool? I'm like, what? He was that guy with his kids. What is he thinking? <laughs> oh, God. Like, uh, uh, yeah. And I didn't know enough to let, like, answer or say nothing. I'm like, yeah, that was my family. He's like, what? He flips right around. That was the end of my consult with him. Well, I, bet, like, I bet you were feeling quite anxious at the time, too. Super. Yeah. You're, you're, I mean, you're anxious through the whole experience. Mm. But then, and then I said, another woman comes up to me with her husband. I'm like, what is going on here? I'm trying to study the menu. And they're like, oh, do you need help? And I'm like, what? And um, he's like, oh, if you partner with my wife. I'm like, what? And he says, um, you can get a discount, get $50 off. And, you know, I'm so, like, you know, just dis discombobulated. I look at him, what are you talking about? He's like, will you connect with her? And I said, I will, but that's the end of our relationship. Sure, so the sure. woman actually helped me yeah. at the end of it because the guy behind the counter tried to be helpful. But if I had, didn't have the cheat sheet from the doctor because you told me what not to do, which is actually more helpful than what to do. Yep. You know, don't do this. Don't take any of this. Don't anything to eat, you know, because it all looks appealing. I mean, they're gummy yeah. bears. You're like, oh, forget. Oh, the places this, are gorgeous. Yeah, the yeah. The products are gorgeous. They are beautiful. Yeah. And this is a dispensary. Please um, correct me if I'm wrong. Dispensers, dispensary specifically for medicinal yes, cannabis. That's right. But it sounds like, um, in some ways, it's more like a, a high end restaurant or novelty experience than going to CVS. Yes. Oh, yeah. There is this idea that they're very sort of customer focused, mm -hmm. and so they're beautiful and all mm -hmm. that stuff. Um, but there is a little bit of a loss of the idea of a sort of clinical experience, mm. which is maybe not as glitzy and sort of um, consumer friendly in yeah. that in that sort of you know Tesla esque way, yeah. but does a little bit more in the hand holding for vulnerable people. Mm. You know, it, the the menus are a little like um, you know it's it's forty pages of a <laughs> French menu with no English translation and you don't speak French. Wow! And yeah. so it all sort of looks like you might, but also that there's a right answer, or at mm. least you think there's a right answer. Oh. So it, because we're talking about health now, right? So if you go into a French restaurant and you wing it, you know, maybe probably you're going to get a good meal. Although mm. once I was in France and ended up with veal kidneys by accident, mm. um, but you know that was. It wasn't a life or death thing. Sure. Whereas when you're sick, you think, look, I got to pick from this menu I yeah. don't understand, and I got to pick the right thing. I've got to get the right thing because that's the one that's going to help. Or else, right. you know, it might interact and, you know. And you're not getting guidance from, you're helpful, but you're not getting guidance from your oncologist. So you feel like, geez, I got to make sure I do the right thing here. So maybe in the long run, as this becomes more mainstream, that experience just needs to change some. It needs to become more medical. <clears throat> This is one of the reasons why I actually went out and campaigned for recreational in this state mm -hmm. was because my feeling is that a lot of the consumer experience is driven by what they're perceiving as the demand mm -hmm. and the demand is in some measure driven by people who have gotten themselves cards but maybe are less ill, shall we say, than what we might consider a, a, a patient. Um, and so Folks who, who you know, have the option to go into a recreational retail establishment will probably migrate in that direction because that's sort of going to be up their alley. Whereas folks like Kate are going to want a more clinical supportive environment and I'm hopeful that our medical dispensaries, at least some of them, will look at this migration and see the residual um, actual true patients and start to specialize and cater to those folks. No, that makes sense. Um, yeah, um, two different things. Very much so. Both legitimate, both, yes. but yep. n different needs and different approaches and that's I think a very important difference. Um, one of the things I would like to see happen is I think we need to get into a prescription 
looking system, right? I mean, there has been lots of discussion about how the federal government controls prescribing and all that stuff, but other states like Florida have written something, they call it an order. But the bottom line is that the physician writes down what you should get and how much and how often you're supposed to use it. And I write all of this on a piece of paper, yeah. but it doesn't carry force of law. It's not an actual prescription. Right. It doesn't make the dispensary do what I say. Gotcha. I think a lot of folks in this country feel that a prescription is the doctor's way of manipulating them. Okay. And to some small extent with particularly dangerous drugs, I think there's some truth to that, but it's minor compared to what's, what I have learned through trial and error is really the key, which is it's about protecting the patient from the overeager seller. Mm. Right. If you go to a CVS with a prescription for a blood pressure medication, there's no wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Would you like a side of Percocet with that? Sure. And there's certainly no arm twisting. You really should get some Percocet because you never know when you're going to need it kind of thing. Mm. And unfortunately, that sort of upsell and side sell is very prevalent amongst the dispensaries despite the fact that I spend a fair amount of time going to them and, and giving talks to their service people and, and such. And it's just that it, you know, that's sort of the nature of if you're gonna sell something, you're gonna try and sell something. Yeah. Um, yeah. On the other hand, CVS is a very lucrative business model, so I don't think it's the, that the current dispensary model is the only way that it can be done. Okay. Uh, uh, just curious, is the person who's selling you behind the counter, do they have certain stipulations about requirements in terms of their role or not? Their None. Job? Okay, that's what I thought. That's, okay. I mean, so yeah. when you go into the dispensary, the person behind the counter is a salesperson, like the cashier at CVS, okay. right? right? So they have, maybe they have some in-house training, but there's certainly no requirement for it, and it certainly doesn't rise to any level of medical uh, background. And yet, they are, liberally bestowing patients with their medical wisdom left mm. and right, all in the service then of generating sales. That's just not right. I mean, aside from the fact that it's sort of misleading and unqualified, I think that sort of in the long run, trying to frame this in, in the terms of the dispensary owner's interests, ultimately as more and more people with true and complex illness get into the system, we're gonna start to see some complications because that's just the nature of the beast. And that's gonna present liability both to the, to the um, service agent, right? And to the dispensary owner. Um, and so I think we're just starting to st that conversation. I was talking with a bunch of um, executives from the insurance industry yesterday, um, and they're starting to think about this. Well, what, what is the liability to the dispensary? What are the liabilities to the agents? How do we ensure this? How do we mitigate that risk by perhaps insisting on at least some level of training, which may as much as say what you can say, it probably would say what you can't say. Mm. Um, right now, it's just wide open. You know, The FDA says you can't say certain things about certain products if right. they haven't been proven, right? right? Medical claims. Yeah. Um, and we're not there yet, but we need to get there. Okay, okay. and. Um to return to you for a moment, Kate, you, you, you get the product, you get the cannabis, you, you bring it home, and, uh, and uh, how does it go? Is it helpful? What, what's your experience? Um, and, and again, I believe you, you were mostly having problems with a lack of appetite, food not tasting good, losing weight, and so on, if I'm correct. Yeah. yeah. Um, it helped. Uh, it made me feel like I could eat. I remember I hadn't eaten in months, and my husband came home, and I was actually cooking, and I hadn't cooked. I didn't have the energy or interest in food. The smell, everything made me, you know, like almost similar but worse than when you're pregnant and you have nausea. It was just the whole. It was forever, and he was thrilled. He's like, "Oh my gosh, Kate!" And I'm like, "I'm eating. I'm hungry. I felt better." Um, you know, I kept pushing myself anyways, but I was able to eat more, and I put on a little bit of weight. So the doctors were pleased because they said I had lost enough that it was, you know, bothering them a little bit. Like, hey, you got to keep keep eating, Kate. Mm -hmm. um, so I found it effective that I did. And uh, how long did you continue to use it to um, get this effect? So I wasn't able to get it until um, it took longer. And I think, you know, the doctor had 
give me that clue. It, it doesn't happen overnight in terms of getting approved for it. Right. And, you know, so if, if the other thing is if you had been prompt, if I had been prompted earlier, it would have helped me too. Because then I would have put my application in, then waited and, you know, and then had that happen. Because it gets progressively worse when you're on chemotherapy, you feel worse and worse and sure. worse. So um, I stopped probably less than eight weeks. I found it useful. I see. And then, you know, I, that, that wasn't, and then the reason I had it wasn't necessary anymore. So. Gotcha. I would add that <clears throat> since your time, yeah. um, the process of application is much faster. So okay. it used to be a couple of weeks if things went well. Sometimes they didn't, <laughs> and then it was longer. But now it's really about three or four days waiting okay. after I do my bit to wait. Is it really? Yeah. That's great. So that's a vast improvement. Yeah. Yours took quite a long time catching. I, I feel like it took a month. You know what I mean? My memory yeah. isn't exact on it. I'd have to go back and look. But I don't know if I, you know, if I told you too, is that I rejected initially too? Yeah. And I just was like, I think it was like no, a paperwork thing it was, or something. It was crazy. What was it? Do you know? Just, yeah, I, I do remember. unfortunately remember this. Mm. But um, it, you know what? It comes down sick. to your name, right? Oh, okay. Remember? And so it wasn't entirely clear what your last name was and the hyphenation. Oh. And it has to, the way I type it in has to exactly match your driver's license. It's like flying. Your name has to be exactly as, as it is on your. Yeah. You know. Oh, so, I see. Um, we still get occasionally caught by that, but in general, um, it, it's less of a problem. Good. Um, so, and, and we've also, through the process of just doing this a lot, developed some expertise at guiding patients through that uh, mm. process. Unfortunately, once the process gets started, there's nothing that we can do to intervene at that point. It's on the Department of Public Health, um, and you know their frontline staff is over uh, overtaxed. Sure. Um, so that that becomes a little bit of an issue, right. uh, and we're hopeful that when the Cannabis Control Commission takes this over sometime in the next six or so months, that that may give us an opportunity to to smooth things out a little bit. I have to say, though, overall. Despite the fact that there are certainly examples of where it's not worked well, and there's certainly been a lot of discussion about when it not, doesn't work well, I'd say that, you know, 90% of my patients sail through that. Okay. That's good. Now, how, how long has it been since all this became possible? Uh, there was a time, I don't know what the timeline is myself, which is why I'm asking, but there was a time when I don't think you would have found a physician who specializes in this. Mm. You wouldn't have been able to go to a dispensary. Uh, it would have been completely unofficial and off the record. When did that, this actually come into being? Well, in Massachusetts, we enacted this through a ballot initiative in 2012. Okay. And then what happened, which was kind of interesting, is that the then state government wasn't really thrilled with this, right? They got, right. it was forced upon them by we the people. Um, so they set up a set of criteria for opening dispensaries that really functionally made it impossible. Mm -hmm. And so from 2012 to the spring of 2014, when we got our first two dispensaries opened, it was legal, but there was nothing, there was no way to get it. And when I first opened my practice, that was before the dispensaries were available. And the only way that worked for me was that I could, as a Massachusetts certifying physician write yet another piece of paper that would allow patients to go to Maine where there were dispensaries oh. at that time. Oh, okay. And I can still do that if people are going up to Maine for vacation, but now it's no longer all that relevant. I see. Okay. Okay. And um, um, Kate, you're, you're well now. Yes. You've, you're, all re you're recovered. You're doing well. You're... Feeling much better and glad to have had the opportunity to feel better mm -hmm. while I was so sick. Yeah. And that's the part that's sad. Yeah. You know what I mean? That the doctors, the, your, your, your doctors who are treating you can't be full circle part of that whole, you know, discussion. Yeah. And that you have to lead the initiative kind of on your own. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, your, your regular treatment team at the hospital is dedicated to helping you get better. But yes. there's this one aspect where they say we, we can't really touch that. Part of it's that they can't touch it because of the federal legality issues okay. and the way that hospitals are funded, which is, frankly speaking, mostly through the federal government mm -hmm. in a number of different ways, so that that's actually a real issue. But even leaving that aside, there's the fact that this is a complex substance and a complex 
sort of treatment that, you know, physicians are cautious and thoughtful yeah. folk, and if they don't know how to do something, they're likely not going to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that's not widely understood sort of in the cannabis advocacy circles. But what I have found, uh, and really this is the basis of my practice, is that going to my colleagues who know me from my being in, their, in the system for a while, they know I'm not a quack. And when I can present them with real data, they go, that's really cool. Mm. I've been met by almost no irrational resistance. Mm. I've, I have been met generally with great enthusiastic curiosity and also great relief that they don't therefore feel the need to, to learn it all and do mm. it all um, and that they can co-manage patients with me. Mm. And then, you know, there's, it's bi-directional. They get notes back from me. Um, the one thing I really wish, and, and Kate's case really speaks to this, is that oftentimes, even with the entree that I've made with all of my colleagues, patients arrive at my doorstep sort of several weeks into their chemo, sort of when it is that they're finally feeling so lousy that they mm. need it. Now. I would like to see mm. them referred to me before they start their chemo. That was your experience, Kate. Yeah, yeah. I, I needed it then. I'm right. like, yeah. I need it now. Exactly. And since it takes a while to get into my practice, just because I'm reviewing records and seeing people, um, but also because then there's an administrative process, mm -hmm. it would be lovely if this was sort of part of the um, initial discussions even before the chemo starts. You know, okay, we're going to start you on this chemo. You're likely to feel, you know, kind of punk. Why don't you go see Dr. Tischler or somebody like him and get this started? And if you don't need it, exactly. great. But it's if you there. do, it's there. Exactly. Yeah. So we'll get there. Because you're yeah. sick when you're on your own kind of chartering it. You don't feel well and, mm. you know, and you're scared and you're confused and you're not a doctor. Mm. So you're like, oh, is this the right thing to do? Or is this like, it's not necessarily the, the right treatment. And then mm. you approach the doctors and they're not able to give you too much either way. Mm. Um, they'll support you if that's what you want to do. But they won't give you, yeah, that's definitely the way you should go or definitely not the way, the way you should go. And you trust them so much because they're making you feel better in many other ways. Mm. So it's almost like... Um, you know, it's not, it's not a priority. You feel guilty. You know what I mean? Almost yeah. saying like, oh, I feel so lousy. I want to be able to just feel a little better to function day to day. And then there's also the stigma that's attached with it too. Right. You know, right. you're like, that's not something I want to have anything to do with. You don't, you don't want your kid's friends to say, well, look at their mom. Yeah, that's not what Guess you want to be known doing. for. You don't want, you know what I mean? Like, that's not something that you want people to in know most, about too. In, in most social situations yeah, anyway. There are, there are places where it's, you know, very mainstream. But a lot of people, it's... Uh, uh, something that they just isn't part of their lives and suddenly it is and it's um, quite a change. I think that things are also improving on that front. I think mm -hmm. that um, in mm -hmm. the general population people are sort of coming out of the closet as, as users whether mm -hmm. we're talking about medically or recreationally and I certainly am seeing um, far more sort of proactive discussion amongst my conventional medical colleagues um, a, a year ago, I was over at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute doing a talk specifically on cannabis and brain tumors because mm -hmm. they have big uh, weekend-long symposium. And, um, you know, all of a sudden the floodgate opens and, like, mm -hmm. you know, my practice is, is nearly overwhelmed with people being referred over. And that's fantastic because, that's you know, there's them. a yeah. group who really need that kind of intervention and the similar sorts of things from the MGH and the Beth Israel and other major hospitals. So mm -hmm. I think we're, we're getting there in terms of those practitioners understanding and feeling comfortable and sort of, again, being a little proactive about it. So there may be more people like yourself over time. And I sure hope so. More around. Well, and, you know, where does someone like yourself start and get your training? I mean, if it's an established specialty, there's a route you go and you're qualified. Right. If it's something that hasn't really been done officially in medicine, how do you get there? Well, I can speak to my own experience with mm. that, you know, after years of being an emergency room physician for the VA, the thing that really kind of piqued my interest was the observation that so many of my patients were so sick from various substances, alcohol really being number one by mm. a long margin, mm. but then also opiates, both prescription and illegal, I sort of thought, well, now we're talking about cannabis could be useful as a medicine, 
it's interesting to observe that I've never really seen anybody sick from cannabis right. compared to all these other, you know, hundreds and hundreds. Um, I don't think you can really OD on cannabis, or, or it's, it's very rare. So the current lore is you can't overdose on cannabis, and I think that's very misleading. Okay. Which is to say you cannot lethally overdose on cannabis. Right. You can't kill yourself, but you can certainly take too much and feel pretty darn sick. Mm. And depending on how you do it, that can be for a protracted period of time. Mm -hmm. The risk in that has more to do with patients like Kate or some of my older patients where if you have a bad initial experience, you're never going to touch it again. Sure. Right? And mm -hmm. then you have lost the opportunity to actually gain the benefit that, that comes with it. So I think that there's value in, in sort of the cautious and thoughtful approach. Mm. Yes, it's great that it won't kill you. Um, mm. I think that there are other aspects that are, that are potentially dangerous. There's some suggestion that in healthy teenagers, this isn't good for their brain development, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Uh, there are components uh, like CBD, which is, are widely available and sort of touted as a, a miracle drug that in fact in the, um, can interact with conventional medications in potentially lethal ways. Um, and so as we see more elderly and more sort of uh, significantly ill patients coming into this field, we are going to see more potential for uh, negative outcomes along with a lot of people also deriving a lot of benefit. It just requires that we be continued thoughtful physicians. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, um, I had a question. It just flew out of my head. Well, oh, <laughs> um, um, you, you, but you have a thought. Go ahead. Well, you were asking about how you get there. So, exactly. And so That's for the one. <laughs> me, what happened was I looked at this somewhat skeptically and said, all right, look, I got to read about this. Mm -hmm. So I went into the medical literature, uh, real primary source stuff, and just started digging around and absorbing it all. And um, don't let anybody ever tell you that we don't have science on this. Mm -hmm. We have more science on cannabis than we have on pretty much any other substance ever. Not all of it's good. The federal government has blocked our ability to do many of the kinds of quality and size studies that we would like. But there's an awful lot there. And you really have to kind of take the point of view that really getting more data on all subjects is always beneficial. But you have to say, do we have enough now to make thoughtful, reasonable decisions, knowing full well that as we get more information, we'll refine our, our, our behaviors. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's where we stand now. That allowed me to then open my practice once I became convinced. And and then I learn a lot from my patients, of course, as we go along. And so the turnaround on all of that is that I've started this now international organization called the Association of Cannabis Specialists. And what we are is a group of physicians who are dedicated to taking care of our patients using cannabis, but the right way, the thoughtful way, the evidence-driven way. Um, and we do a lot of educational stuff for physicians who would be considering joining that uh, field, but also again uh, for referring clinicians who might not want to get into the into the prescribing or recommending of cannabis, but need to know enough that they can say this so and so would benefit from this and let me refer. And we work a lot with dispensaries and product manufacturers to make sure that the patients are getting quality medications, that they're getting treated appropriately, as we were talking about earlier in terms of what the bud tender is saying or not saying. And then obviously we also have a large political arm that's aimed at trying to interface with that federal government and get them to make more rational and, and, and supportive laws that will allow us to get more science and more data and refine from there. So this is a big problem, the fact that the laws are different on the federal level, it's just illegal. Yep. On the state and local levels, it varies from place to place. But um, uh, depending on who feels motivated to enforce their particular laws, uh, it can either be tolerated or there can be a crackdown on the federal level, I would think. Um, that makes it much harder. It does. There's a lot of fear. Um, you know, under the Obama administration, there was the Cole Memorandum, uh, which basically laid out a bunch of conditions by which they would 
not interfere with states medical program. So basically, mm. they were kind of reasonable set of criteria. Let's try not to have this end up in the hands of kids. Let's make sure we're following where the medicine comes from and where it goes and such like that, you know, basic reasonable safeguards. And now, um, uh, you know, the Attorney General Sessions has decided to rescind that. Um, he hasn't put in place sort of a kill order. He's not said, go get him. But what he's really done is said to his district U.S. attorneys, yeah, do what you like. Um, many of the district attorneys have said, I don't see any reason to change our behavior. Mm. Our Massachusetts district attorney, U.S. district attorney, um, ha who was appointed by Trump, unlike many of the others who were appointed previously, have said, we're going to consider this case by case, which is not a resounding, no, we're not going to do anything. Mm. I haven't had the chance to meet him. I'm told he's a very reasonable person. So I think, you know, it, we're going to have to see. But any, even the wait and see approach, though sort of seemingly reasonable, it creates uncertainty and uncertainty makes it hard for people like Kate to say, look, I need this. I'm going to do it, right? <laughs> Were you worried, Kate, when you were uh, using the cannabis um, and you found it helpful that, um, you know, what happens if uh, somebody finds out about this and I get in trouble? Uh, what if, I, I, I don't know, I'm asking. I mean, um, I, I guess I, I wasn't overt about it. Okay. You know, my car okay. doing stuff or, yeah. you know. That, you, you weren't walking down the sidewalk yeah, using no. your medical cannabis? And in all honesty, if I, I probably, if I reflected on it later, I might have been, but I did not feel well. Sure. And that was the overarching thing that, you know what, I assume people are reasonable because mm. it wasn't anything that I would have embraced previously, mm. but I wanted to feel better. I was at my, my privacy, my own home. I knew it was legal in Massachusetts mm. at that point, and I felt comfortable enough trying to just, you know, privately Sure. You know, use it as medicine. I felt like I had. A, I felt like I had a reason. So. And did you happen to discover? Um, I don't know the answer to this question, which is why I'm asking. Do you happen to discover that there's any kind of uh, community of patients out there who are being treated for cancer who may be using this treatment option and <laughs> share information with each other? Or did you feel like it was just you? Um, hmm. um, currently using it, you felt alone. You know okay. what I mean? Okay. There, there were people out there. There was a couple people in the school that were, like, the community in Lexington is a very warm and embracing community. So there were a couple people I knew. There was one woman whose um, daughter was sick with it, and I knew the husband. But I remember the husband had to travel to California to get it back oh. and bring oh. it back. So okay. it, was, it was an issue for them to deal with. But um, when you're sick, and this is the part that you really have the most kind of, you know, the most sympathy that I have moving forward, you're really not feeling well enough to... I didn't even want to like leave the house. Mm. You know, you, I did not feel enough to have to go. I remember like being totally aggravated that I had to go and meet him and go through my <laughs> records because I felt so sick. That's a lot of work. I mean, it was like it, it took a lot of my energy. You know, you don't feel well. You you know, you're wearing a wig. Yet you feel sick. You just mm. you're sick. So mm. to to have to even like think about talking about it with anyone else was not of any interest to me. Gotcha. I had done my due diligence. I had talked to people. I had spoken to my doctor, and that was. You know, I, it was enough of my energy to get to him and deal with it and then kind of move forward with it. I wonder if there, if there was such a community, uh, and I don't know. If it's it, a if wonderful it, idea. I don't it should know. be. Well, I, well, I was wait, wondering. Let me jump in. Yeah, here. you may yeah, know. Maybe there you is one. Well. I don't know. <laughs> so there are, there are definitely sort of independent groups, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they sort by, you know, whether the cancer groups or veterans groups and okay. such like that. Uh, there's also the Massachusetts Patients Advocacy Alliance, which is a political group. They're the people who initiated the ballot that led to medical being around. But oh. they also have sort of a social component to it. But the other thing is that my practice, we run a support group every six weeks. Okay. You do and it. Other, good, good. other yeah. groups do that. As a matter of fact, I am, hmm, I don't remember the date. It's Sunday, March 4th, I want to say, okay. doing a support group. Uh, not of my own practice, but I'm coming into somebody else's support group to kind of um, give a little spiel, mm -hmm. and um, this specifically about cancer and cancer treatment. Um, so yes, there are groups out there, um, and I can get you the details on that uh, offline, and maybe you can 
I'll let people know. Sure. Um, we could yeah, probably so we could probably put a URL at the bottom of the screen at the end of the show. Yeah. Once, once we because have it that. is a great idea. Well, especially at the beginning, before you even feel really sick. Oh, that's the if, if somebody people. just said, by the way, there is a group out there. There's a, there's a doctor who specializes in this. He has a support group. Maybe there's another support group. If it comes to that, opt in, you know. opt out. Yeah. You know. I think that most of the folks who come to my support group, <laughs> I've, I've always conceived of it as you had said, where people would come who are using the stuff to, for benefit and talk to each other and kind of get that kind of support. Mm. And I think there's some of that. I'd like to see more of that, actually. But what I do find um, is that people come to the support group to meet me. To make sure that I'm for oh, real, oh. you know, and and you know, I then end <laughs> up talking about what are the what's the evidence and how do you do it and what's it like in the, in, in the dispensary and all that sort of thing, and it allays a lot of fears. So then they're willing to proceed with actually making a formal visit to my office. So they want to check you out. Yeah, and that's yeah. fine too. You know, I'm that's here to be checked out. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny. Well, that's yeah, ideal. That makes uh, sense, actually. Go. And whatever helps that facilitates their feeling comfortable enough <laughs> that we can get feel them better. to the point right where they feel better. It's most exactly. important. Yep. And your practice is called, again, Inhale MD. And um, I'm sorry, which city is it in? I have two offices, oh. one in Brookline and one in Cambridge. I see. Okay. So basically, either side of the river. I see. So in Brookline, you're near the dispensary that we talked about, mm -hmm. or at least in the same town. Yeah, it's very near. <laughs> yeah, okay. It's funny that the, uh, well, maybe not funny is the right word, ironic, that the uh, dispensary in Brookline is in a bank. And one of the issues with this industry is the banks don't want to touch the money often. So that makes it harder for them to do business. It's not even for the dispensaries. Yeah. So I mentioned the Association of Cannabis Specialists. Okay. We went to a bank, and I'm not going to mention their particular name just because I don't want to pick on them. Mm. But they said, oh, yes. Doctors, we'd love to have you, blah, blah, blah. And then we went through all this, signing the, the, the signature cards and everything. We thought it was a done deal. Mm. And two days later, sorry, we can't do this. Oh. This was a, you know, a, a, band, a bank that has a very strong presence around here. Um, <laughs> and so suddenly my, my you know, uh, 501c4 nonprofit doesn't have a place to put its few shekels. So we scrambled around and found another bank. And so far, not what that's holding. But... It's a problem, and you know we're a bunch of doctors, and we don't touch the plant. We're not, you know, like we're pretty far removed yeah. from anything that you would call illegal. But that's the kind of, you know, uh, stigma, yeah, stigma yeah. and 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 fear that the even the banks feel just because they're federally regulated. Well, and and you know we we talked earlier about how. Uh, the, the federal laws uh, certainly do affect um, these things and people get nervous about uh, whether they might be breaking the law or something like that. But we also talked about how there seems to be a, sort of an irrational um, fear and uh, a concern about cannabis in some quarters, uh, considering that in, in some ways it appears to be a fairly safe drug compared to, for instance, the opioids that we've had so much trouble with the last few years. Or uh, alcohol. Or alcohol, right, which, which is, which, which is pretty, a dangerous drug. Yeah. And you can buy that, you know, on every street corner if you're old enough. And um, so, so why is this a, uh, why is this a rational prejudice, mm -hmm. if that's the right word, uh, there when it comes to cannabis? Well, this country has a, a long and complicated history with cannabis that is really only a small you know, facet of its long and complicated history with um, racism. Okay. So, you know, what really was happening in the early part of the 20th century was that alcohol prohibition was ending and there were lots of um, enforcement agencies that were going to be without something to do. Oh. So they needed to criminalize something else. And it was around that same time there were a lot of land barons who had invested in hardwood forests for paper production, and there was a technological advance that would allow cannabis or hemp to compete with that hardwood, and it grows much more readily and much more quickly, so it would outcompete that. And then there was this whole thing about how the people who would then grow the cannabis or hemp could do it on small tracts of land, which meant people of color. Hmm who typically didn't have large pieces of land or good pieces of land would actually be able to have a, a, a reasonable wage 
Right. We can't have that in this country, of course. Right. Um, so it became illegal as a commodity item, not as a drug, but as a commodity item, including hemp and cannabis. And that, that was the law of the land from 37 to late 69, mm -hmm. right? And in 1969, Timothy Leary took a case to the Supreme Court and won. Mm -hmm. And suddenly the Marijuana Tax Act of 1937 was overturned. I see. And within two months, Richard Nixon installed the Controlled Substances Act and plunked cannabis and LSD um, and a bunch of other things into Schedule One, which meant completely forbidden, don't even think about it, no, don't even look at no it. No legitimate use. No legitimate use. And it wasn't based on science. In fact, as early as 72, there were challenges to that uh, uh, schedule based on science, but they were always rejected. And even into the middle 80s, the DEA's own administrative judge, who's the judge that's there to kind of keep them on the straight and narrow, said there is no rational scientific basis for this being Schedule One, and I recommend that it be removed from Schedule One. And the DEA said, yeah, we don't feel like it. Wow. So there's financial interests over the years. There's prejudice of various types. <clears throat> Misinformation, I, I imagine. Oh, I'm sure. Um, you know, now we're in a position where there's a huge for-profit prison system mm -hmm. that benefits tremendously from this because I don't remember the actual number, but it's a number larger than 50% of offenders incarcerated in these prisons are there for minor cannabis-related violations. If you didn't have that steady stream of, of uh, prisoners, you'd be out of... In business, right? And that and, can't be allowed. And if, it, if it's a private prison, that's, that's terrible. Right, it's for, pro for profit. Yeah. That's a fascinating topic. Um, we've spoke for an hour, and it went by very quickly. That was an hour. <laughs> wow. Wow. Thank you. So I want to thank you both for coming in. Um, I hope a lot of people watch this and, uh, and learn as much as I do. And Kate, I'm glad that you're feeling so much better. Thanks, that's Kate. the bottom line. It really is. It really is. It really is. It really is. Um, so, uh, this has been In Conversation. Uh, thank you for watching. <laughs>